Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar. My name is Paola Rivetti. I'm an associate professor in Dublin City University here in Dublin, Ireland. Um, so we're really fortunate and we're really delighted to welcome you all to this uh, 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 IIEA event. Uh, today, we're very happy to be joined by Tahrase Perifar, who's a researcher in the Middle East and North African Division at Human Rights Watch, who's been very generous to take time out of our busy schedule to speak to us today on International Women's Day. Tahra will speak to us for about 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to our Q&A session with our audience. So you will be able to join the discussion with the using the Q&A function on your on Zoom. Um, you should see that on your on your screen on your screen. Sorry, and please feel free to send your question in throughout the session as they occur to you. And feel free not to wait for you know, the official beginning of the Q&A uh, session. Um, we will come to them once Tahra has finished her presentation. By, as I, but as I said, you're very welcome to let us know uh, what questions you have um, you know, as soon as you, as, you, as you have them. So a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on record. Feel free to join the discussion on Twitter uh, using the handle at double I E A. We are also live streaming uh, this afternoon's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in via YouTube. So I'd like now to uh, briefly introduce our distinguished speaker today and then hover and hand over to her. Sara Seperifar is a researcher at the, in the Middle East and North Africa division where she investigates human rights abuses in Iran and in Kuwait. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she was a deputy director at the Human Rights in Iran unit at the City University of New York, where she worked on a project supporting the mandate of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Iran. Tara graduated from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, Iran, and holds an MA and LLM degrees in international law from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Stafts University. Um, Tara, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, I feel obliged to begin by wishing everyone a happy March 8th um, and all those who have been fighting for a more equal world before us and are still doing it. I'm very delighted to be here on this day and talking about um, something that has captured the attention of the world. Um, in September 2022, um, Iranian uh, Iranian people, led by women and youth, um, embarked on a new protest movement that has captured the attention of the world. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the iconic images of women um, burning their headscarf in protest, gathering in street despite serious risks to their safety and even their, their life. Um, the protest that began um, after the death in custody of a 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman um, who was arrested by Iran's abusive morality police quickly spread to more than um, 100 cities and universities across the country um, and calls for fundamental change um, were echoed across the board with generations of um, protesters either joining the street protests or echoing it online. Um, these protests um, were and are significant for so many reasons. I think first and foremost, the durability and the widespread nature of them. It, this was the first time that we saw um, pro, um, uh, protests in Iran um, after a very long time that happened both in major cities as well as smaller towns, in minority areas as well as the center of the country. Um, the, pro the, the protest um, duration 
uh, were largely extended by university campuses joining the protest movement and, and holding protests for, for months. Um, the protests are also largely leaderless, um, which raises questions about leadership and, and, and how they can transform, um, transform power, but also allows for conversations to happen um, at a very intersectional level about what it means to uh, be part of a protest movement that is bringing generations of, of protesters together uh, from different backgrounds with different lived experiences. Um, I think it's fair to say that the leading slogan of, of the movement, Women, Life, Freedom, has brought um, generations of demands that have been echoed by different um, protest movements in Iran over the, the past 20, um, 20 years um, to connect um, the question of individual autonomy and choice of dress code to the broader political, political um, repression and, and the struggle for civil and political rights, as well as economic justice together. Um, using compulsory hijab as, as a symbol of the protests um, makes a lot of sense in the Iranian context. It's harder to find an issue that is more vis that's more of a visible um, manifestation of how the, uh, the authoritarian nature of governance in Iran tries to control every aspect of individuals' life and how individual choices um, can inherently be seen as political. Um, so in that sense, while the demands are much broader and are there are calls for fundamental change, um, the fight against uh, compulsory hijab laws and their very abusive enforcement in Iran really symbolizes the, 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 the broader struggle. But of course, we have not arrived here over time. Iranian people did not decide to take to take them to the street in, in such widespread fashion in September of 2022. People have been organizing, fighting, and resisting repression for decades. Um, actually, Iranian women had to break from political parties and organize their own um, their own protest movement in, in the early early days after the Iranian uh, revolution in 79 when they when they um, staged protests against um, against compulsory hijab laws at the time that um, even more progressive political parties did not see it as a priority. Um, over time, women's movement in Iran have tried to change um, discriminatory laws and practices through various ways. In 2005, they launched a campaign called One Million Signature Campaign. It was aimed at changing uh, discriminatory laws through legislative route. Um, and that was one of the first um, organized uh, collective movements um, in the country to, to have the conversation about what it means to, to tackle um, discriminatory laws that were actually a regression at the time of, at the, time of the revolution. As um, avenues for legislative change and, and elective um, power diminished within the structure of the Islamic Republic of Iran, women's rights movement also turned to various ways to impact the situation. They have worked on um, issues such as street harassment, raising awareness about, um, about the discriminatory laws and going about changing them through, um, through public campaigning and, and um, towards public opinions. They have worked with businesses and private sectors to, to protect women. Um, just past two, three years, um, um, Iran also went through a wave of Me Too movement. Imagine in a country that consensual sexual relationship is criminalized, um, the conversation have, has moved forward so much that women came forward with account of, of abuse and, and sexual harassment outside accepted legalized avenues. And, forced a conversation in um, 
obviously selected elements of the society and, and had had this conversation echoed in, in academic and, and activism and circles. Um, so um, in that sense, when we when protesters come together around an ish, an umbrella of women women's rights and their centrality to the protest movement it is the result of generations of civil civil society and and, and local mobilization and interaction with public opinion that has finally connected these dots um and in a country like iran that um there are very serious restrictions for freedom of expression and assembly. Um, digital space um, has been an integral part of public space. I think in many countries, it's it's going to be difficult to to separate what is what is digital space, what is what is the physical space we have, and what is digital. These these spaces have really merged. And it's that's true in, in the case of Iran as well, that many people use it not just for expressing their opinion, but also for um, connecting, but also, but also mobilizing um, collective action. Um, and to put that just in context, um, Iran, Iranians' connectivity to internet um, drastically increased about 10 years ago when um, the previous administration allowed um, uh, internet providers to, to provide the 3G and 4G internet on mobile phone that really expanded um, Iranians' access to to internet and and bridge some of the generational gap that existed in in access to um, computer literacy in 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 generally um, um, stable at home internet and it penetrated in in areas that are more marginalized and and allowed people to connect. Um, connect online um, when we talk about internet usage in Iran I think main usage. For, for ordinary people is actually using social media and messaging applications. So for many people, being connected online is synonym to being able to use messaging applications, connecting to social media, being connected to family and the broader community. And this allowed, um, this al created space for women to also um, be part of the, a part of the conversation that have always been journalists, academics, intellectuals, but this really expanded access to many ordinary women who were small business owners. They were able to create um, create um, social media pages for their own business. We have, we have currently a lot of lifestyle bloggers, social media influencers, people who talk about um, everyday aspect of their lives from different parts of the country. It allowed for local groups to form around um, parents for schools, villages organizing for, for their local needs. And it also connected people across the country. It's, it, it was much easier to see what life looked like for another person in a, in a province remote from the center. And I think all of those um, were elements that then were used in this protest movement um, to unite um, protesters and allow for the conversation to to take place at a, at a more intersectional level. Um, in this protest movement, um, while the actions were taken in the street and it was an attempt to create an alternative reality um, a life without compulsory dress code for many people. Um, social media and, and the way um, women used social media was, was crucial and, and critical in amplifying, recording, and, 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 um, and preserving that, that image. So the, the, the changes in lifestyle that had already was already on their way in the Iranian society. You could trace it um, through Instagram, for instance, which was which is a the most popular social media application in Iran. And, and research shows that over the past two years has actually become much more political, um, and people are using a lot more political content on it. Um, was was 
being taken out in the street, but also pres preserved again on social media. Um, it allowed for creation of um, art, music, um, and different initiatives in support and framing of the demands of the protest. And, and of course, echoing it back to um, not just Iranians, but also international audience in so many ways. Um, just as an example, for instance, um, while a, a lot of attention was, was paid rightly on protesters who were putting themselves at the, at the front line and risking their lives. And, and we all know that the Iranian government responded it is, to these protests with brutal force, killing hundreds of protesters and arresting thousands. A lot of ordinary people, public figures were also lending their support through demonstrating acts of resistance online and offline and connecting them. One of the very memorable photos um, of the early days of the, the protest movement that I remember was um, was a woman uh, who had taken head, her headscarf off and had gone to a less affluent neighborhood in, in Tehran and was having breakfast next to a table of men but her friend. There was no commentary, nothing. A photo of that was, was published um, on social media and gone viral. And it was basically one person's attempt to solidify this alternative reality um, and echo that message back to the society. Um, something that you hear very often from protesters and people we talk to and activists is that co uh, courage is contagious. And social media was utilized to solidify that image and broadcast it and, and, and gain solidarity. Um, and I think um, a lot of, needless to say, as I said, a lot of the organizing and mobilization at the very local level is also happening in digital space. Because it is a leaderless movement, first and foremost, as a result of the very repressive nature, and many of these networks are kept um, at a very local level and at a very grassroots level and not necessarily um, visible to outsiders. But, um, but uh, you can trace how women have tried to in, have their perspective interjected in um, in the protest movement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, minority areas have been um, very important in durability of these protests to this date. Um, um, the city of Zahedan in Sistan and Baluchistan province, which is one of the most marginalized areas of the country, has been holding continuous protest every Friday after the Friday prayer imam, uh, uh, after the Friday prayers, and with the leadership of the local imam, um, and they have experienced one of the most brutal crackdowns against protesters. Um, this is an area that women experience various levels of marginalization to begin with. They're not very visible in the society. Their role is not accepted. But what was fascinating for me was that um, even though these protests were capturing a lot of attention and for the first time the center was taking note of various aspects of um, Baluchi minorities, including their culture, men dancing, because in the mind, minds of someone who lives in the center in Iran, Baluchistan is about poverty and trafficking and, and bordering um, bordering uh, Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan and having a lot of securitized issues, while they were witnessing a very different aspect of Baluchi life. Women who felt, Baluchi women who felt eliminated and silenced in the protest movement that was being led by a society that's more conservative, um, they created their own video of cutting their hair and taking their headscarf off with their own Baluchi clothes and, and put it online. They issued statements, they, they put out their own narrative, basically um, trying to influence the conversation at the very local level that you cannot, if you want to lead on this movement, it has to be um, as a part of the broader broader um, conversation of women, life, freedom. You can't eliminate women if you are not seeing it. We women, Baluchi women are fighting various levels of marginalization and discrimination, and we want to be part of this. Um, so these are not immediately visible if you're looking at a macro look, but as soon as you get slightly deeper, there's a lot more to, to digest about how um, the space is um, 
is actually um, it, space is is provided for conversations um, at the uh, in a horizontal way, and I think um, one note that is probably on the minds of many is like how's the situation right now in Iran while the protests, the street protests that are the most visible form of this protest movement have slowed down. And the anger, frustration, the calls for fundamental change are still very much there. And, and those everyday struggles and everyday acts of resistance of people that have predated the movement, intensified through the movement, are still continuing. Um, the government um, that initially responded with heavy lethal force and arrest of um, thousands moved ahead with bringing capital charges against um, dozens of protesters in, in extremely unfair trials carried out for executions and then issued um, some um, amnesty and pardons to, to number of protesters is now trying to reinforce um, laws in, and control in various ways, including uh, compulsory hijab laws that are being discussed on um, various levels through economic repression and issuing fines through um, depriving people of access to social benefits. Um, but um, nevertheless, women are still persisting. And, and from what we understand, many um, are still refusing to wear, wear hijab and that they don't believe in and they see it as an act of resistance and they see it as being connected to the to the broader movement the the person i mentioned um who shared a photo of herself having breakfast after her photo went viral she was arrested and spent some time in prison was released um released from prison on bail um just last week um she posted another photo of herself with another group of friends doing the exact same thing, just kind of demonstrating that the, continu the continuity and, and the persistent of how they see the fight. Um, and I think I will just add a few more sentences about how the Iranian government is repressing the digital space, because that's um, everything I said is not invisible to, to Iranian authorities as well. So over the past decade, they have really tried to um, build in an infrastructure that allows them to control internet in various ways. Um, initial um, government response to the issue of internet in Iran was, was attempting to restrict and block platforms um, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, some of the earlier versions of social media. Um, but the solution to that was always finding ways to circumvent censorship. Um, over the past, I think, decade, they have become much more so sophisticated, looking at models such as um, the, uh, the one that um, the Chinese government is leading, trying to create the infrastructure that would allow them to control and disconnect internet when they, they see the, the use. Um, so over the past three years alone, we have seen much more sophisticated internet shutdowns during the protest. And we've also seen a huge push for creating domestic alternatives to social media platforms and messaging applications that are controlled by government. So right now, when the internet is, um, is shut down in Iran, access to global internet is shut down, and that doesn't allow us to monitor, it doesn't allow us to talk to people, banking system, pizza delivery, the, the version, domestic version of Uber still work in Iran. And that's the vision that the authorities ultimately have for the ultimate control of internet by tampering with um, uh, uh, tampering with price of internet, tampering with access, depend uh, by profiling different people. Um, so I think the the battle over how unrestricted internet access for Iranians can be preserved is one of the um, very important um, important fights for Iranian civil society and those who are trying to support them and empower them in um, envisioning the change that they, they wish to see. Um, so, and so I think in that sense, the battle for uh, equal rights for women and, and, and women's rights 
is inherently tied to battle to this battle for um, preserving um, Iran Iranians access to internet and those are some of the areas that that a lot of us are focused on trying to to solve the equation of how to keep how to keep power on the side of people um, and I think with that I will end my remark and and just open it up for a conversation because I shared a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tara. It was really interesting. Um, so thanks for, for being so generous with comments and for, uh, you know, uh, sharing all that you've shared. Um, so I'd like to remind our audience that they can submit their questions to the Q&A box. Um, you know, as, as soon as you have questions, um, please um, just include your name and affiliation. Um, and while we are waiting for, you know, for some questions, I I actually have many, but perhaps, um, you know, a, a first question to start off with um, is about the limitation of online um, or digital activism. Um, you mentioned some of the limitations when you were talking about the, um, the strategies that the regime and the state is, is implementing to control, um, you know, who's going online, who's doing what online, and so forth and so on. I was also, um, you know, I would be interested in knowing your, your opinion um, about another perhaps limitation, um, which is the, um, you know, the, the diffusion of um, uh, news and the diffusion of information that might, um, you know, might be regarded as some, you know, turning into some form of misinformation. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular to, uh, you know, just something that has been happening right now in Iran with the poisoning of uh, of schoolgirls, um, you know, you might have, uh, I'm, I'm sure we all have heard of, uh, and how, um, you know, there are so many conflicting reports on, on this um, that is really difficult to kind of, uh, uh, you know, to kind of um, um, understand what's, what's going on and, and make an informed judgment about this. Um, but I was also wondering, um, what about uh, VPNs? Uh, so I've heard a lot about them and people actually being able to kind of circumnavigate, um, uh, you know, uh, state restrictions of uh, of access to to the internet. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on on how they work. Sure, I can I can start with the first one and and also answer the second one. So. Um, I mean, I think we're at a stage um, globally with social media that we're like, okay, we thought this was social media was for liberation. We're also realizing that, well, but there might be some downside to it. So globally, we're trying to figure out and balance the, the pluses and minuses of um, this expansive access to news and this horizontal level that, um, that every citizen, every person, every account can participate in sharing of information, circulating information, and drawing conclusion. Um, and generally, the way we work in Iran, because we, we're not on the ground, um, we don't have a presence on the ground. The Iranian government does not allow us to travel or be based there. Um, we take a very conservative approach in um, documenting facts. We review um, material that is available online, including videos, try to verify them, geolocate them, make sure that that, that the date is correct. And then we speak to witnesses, families of those who've experienced human rights violations to put the, the full picture together. Um, but in this landscape, you have media, you have social media influencers, you have this urge of um, wanting to report. Um, and so you have uh, various sources of information that makes um, documentation work more tricky. And another element of uh, that I think is important to, to keep in mind is um, you also have state influence and various political agendas influencing public opinion. We also have the Iranian intelligence, I think, being much more sophisticated in using this space. Initially, our understanding of internet, let's say in 2009 protest movement was that, okay, you have the, the protesters online trying to, use, um, trying to use internet to advance their cause, and then you have government trying to restrict it. That has, that landscape has completely changed. Um, 
their accounts affiliated with with government both in official and in in unofficial capacity um trying to be be present and and um, and lay out their narrative, which is not necessarily the problem, but over the past years, I think there have also been a lot of misinformation and disinformation campaigns. Um, we, there are a lot of research that, that points to the Iranian state-backed uh, actors, um, or at least points the finger at them. Um, and I think the, the goal behind it is not necessarily to prove one thing wrong or right, is to cast doubt about the whole thing. It's it's to cast doubt about the credibility of uh, um, human rights groups documenting credibility of opposition media reporting on on Iran. Um, so it's not necessarily that the, the misinformation is shared because they want to tarnish this specific person. What they want is for the people to ultimately conclude that this is too complicated. I can never know the truth. And the way they've been much more sophisticated in um, in pushing targeted harassment and misinformation against um, entities and groups and people who do this work, which makes our work much more difficult. To the question that you raised about the very concerning reports of, of poisoning of hundreds of schoolgirls across the country, it's extremely concerning. Um, there is uh, authorities have come out suggesting a level of coordination and deliberate intent, um, um, which then uh, only raises the alarm bell about who the perpetrators are. It, doing something at such scale is, is extremely concerning. Um, what is needed is impartial um, and transparent investigation. Um, and unfortunately, Iranian government has a very dismal track record of ever taking on these issues with the vigor and transparency that's needed. Um, there are various um, waves of um, similar uh, vigilante attacks on women or or um, violations that suggest involvement or some sort of um, support by those who might not be seen as um, dissent um, the voices in the country that have never been investigated properly by Iranian government. So we're in a situation that um, it is extremely important for prompt, uh, for prompt and transparent investigation to, to share what they know, because this is happening amid um, um, very harsh crackdown against protesters, including um, school children who took part in in um, part to, uh, who took part in protests and schools were trying to control them for the first time we, we saw school children participating so it's causing a lot of anxiety among um, children and their parents and in different areas we've heard that that it's already having an impact on on some girls not wanting to go to school because of the trauma um, but nothing short of a transparent investigation can can shed light and about the question of use of vpns um vpns have become a regular part of iranian iranians everyday life some of them described to you that we have like 12 different vpns try to use them on a daily basis to see if they can connect to internet um so um vpns allow um uh, allow for change of IP address and then basically find a detour for them to connect to, to global internet. The problem when the global shutdown happens, you don't have any route outside Iran in order to connect to internet. So VPNs work in regular situation when internet is restricted. Um, but for situations of internet shutdown, we need to think of more fundamental solutions. You need to be able to connect to a computer outside the country. Through a computer inside the country, you need to be connected to outside the country in order to save combat. So a lot of work and thought are being uh, put into um, solving that problem, but Iranian government is, is advancing rapidly on being able to control the system. 
Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna we have two slash three questions. Uh, so perhaps I'm gonna I'm gonna read the first two and then we proceed to to the third one after you reply the first two. Uh, so Kelino Sullivan, who's a researcher at the institute, uh, thank you very much for your incredible insights today. As you outlined, the younger generation have been using social media, but could you touch on how or if the voices of older generations of Iranian women can be platformed on social media. We have another question by Peter Gunning, a former Irish ambassador and also member of the Institute. Thank you for a very informative talk. As you said, the women's struggle has been joined to the wider mood of this, uh, sorry, has been joined to the wider mood of discontent in Iran. Is this significant that establishment figures like Khatami and Mir Hossein Musavi have spoken out on the protest and the need for at least some reforms? So, um, yes, I mean, the new generation is grew up with social media. They don't remember a world without a smartphone. Um, they know how to utilize it. They're very good at creating reels and apps and, and using apps to like create digital content. Um, but um, because of restrictions um, on internet, a much larger group of people, uh, restrictions on free expression and also just restrictions on access to news, a much broader group of people use social media to get their information. Um, and, and in domestic a, sur a survey done domestically um, showed the shift from um, uh, official news outlets, Iran State TV, domestic papers, to social media following, particularly following the 2009, 2018 and 2019 um, mass protests that were also brutally repressed. So you have the presence of other um, other generations, but more as um, I think users than content creators. Um, but they are also sharing insights online. It drives me crazy how much text I need to read on Instagram. People share their articles, really long articles on Instagram, and it's not a platform for text. But because it wasn't initially uh, filtered and it has the capability of including political, entertainment, social, fashion, all of that in one, in one setting, it has become the platform for having the conversation. And, and so you have journalists, you have older respect the human rights lawyers and advocates also sharing their articles in like comments on Instagram. And those are very insightful, just not really easy to read. Um, for the International um, Women's Day at, at Human Rights Watch, we decided to interview a 51-year-old woman in Tehran who had joined the movement of not wearing a headscarf in protest. Um, because and, and her insight of how she sees the struggle of the newer generation. And I've seen the tremendous amount of support among the older generation and and this duality of hope and peril knowing that the, the the capability of the government for repression but also hope for the new generation and um, and the people who are in the streets um have parents who remember early 2000s so each generation has kind of passed this struggle to the next and while the ones we see most vocal in the street may be the youth they are supported by they're supported by their parents and grandparents who, who, who share some of this struggle on the question of domestic political forces um every round of protests and this one was the most significant one you see more voices um saying this situation is not sustainable. For those who've been eliminated from power, for those who've never been allowed to be part of power, the situation is the same. But what you have is that over the past two decades, um, the, the unelected the authoritarian body of governance in Iran led by Ayatollah Khamenei has um, continuously closed down the circle, eliminating political forces in the previous um, 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 elections, the presidential elections, they disqualified the spokesperson for the parliament and 
paved the path for election of um, current president Ebrahim Raisi, who is accused of uh, accused of uh, participating in a very uh, dark chapter of Iranian history and in, 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 in the execution of thousands of political prisoners in the 80s. So political forces have have been eliminated from the space for legislative reform, and yet they have everyone who's at the margin is still raising alarm bells. It is significant that um, the reformist voices are raising their concerns. What is not clear to me is that how much they enjoy popular support. Um, Iranians have tried participation in the election, have tried multiple routes, and they're in the face of, we've tried it all, this is not working. But um, from the way the, 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 um, the authorities are responding to these statements, you can, you can tell that they still sense the potential power that forces from within can have and they're resisting it. I mean, Hossein Musavi has been under house arrest for the past, um, since 2011, for the past 13 years. And, and as soon as his statement came out calling for a constitutional assembly and a referendum, um, apparently the restrictions um, were tightened on his house arrest. So um, from the reaction of authorities, you see that they still see them as potential, but I think people are in the face of trying the power of social movement to try to tip this very unequal power balance that has become more and more unequal over time. Thank you, Tara. So we have uh, two more questions. So the first one by Gronia Haynes from the Department of Foreign Affairs, who asks, what can the outside digital world, including tech companies do to ensure voices from the digital activism movement in Iran are heard? And then we have another question let me just one second, from Karen Thornhill. Actually, two questions from Karen. Um, so the first one is, when Western governments support and arm repressive regimes in the region, um, dictatorship, absolute monarchies, and apartheid regimes, does this undermine the credibility of the movement? And the second of the movement, I mean, the inside movement of Iran, I guess. And the second question is, what can be done to shake the perception that reporting in Iran is shaped by geopolitical motivated regime change operations similar to those that have occurred? So question about the digital um, community. Um, so as I explained, this um, move for restricting internet is shaped coordinated led by Iranian government. Um, uh, but um, broad sectoral sanctions um, have also impacted the tech company's ability to um, provide um, certain kind of services to Iranians. That was the, after several years, in the beginning of the protest, um, the US government issued a new general license that expanded the exemptions for tech companies to, um, to, pro uh, to provide support to Iranians for communication technologies. I can go into the, the, the details of what's the difference, what it meant, but essentially they expanded what constitute communication. So many of the services, cloud services, platforms that communication can, can, be facil can facilitate communication are now exempted under that. What we have been trying to do is to encourage um, tech companies to, um, to take advantage of that to the maximum level, um, to, do every to make available the platforms that are essential for Iranians, um, but also um, finding ways to include Iran and Iranian in their general programming which has a lot of restrictions. So you can't have ads, in, you can't receive ads from Iran, you can't receive money from Iran because of the sanction, which complicates a whole set of services that are typically provided through tech companies. But there's a lot that could be done um, to um, support um, the digital space in Iran from outside the country. Many of them are very technical, but it's important to prioritize, include and work collaboratively with activists in that space that are connected to people inside the country. Um, and and um, tech companies have more resources 
and more platform and more expertise to bypass some of these technical issues than let's say a group of um group of um internet freedom experts at an NGO that are trying to do that. So that partnership is very crucial. And, and, and if there is interest, I, I'm definitely happy to get into it offline with anyone who's working on, on that intersection. Um, our, uh, use of the providing of arms to rep uh, repressive states in the region, geopolitics, I'm not going to say they don't exist because they're there and we're uh, we're um if I was speaking about the role um that the, the west is playing in fueling the war in Yemen first and foremost it would be like the arms that are going in so the the issue is we are dealing with a region that is not being treated equally when it comes to human rights. Um mostly um western governments have their double standards have their uh, in um, raising um, similar, not same, similar patterns of human rights violations in various countries. Um, what might uh, result in a strong statement in Iran requires um, advocacy, uh, much stronger advocacy to even have any any impact in Egypt, like for, for governments raised in Egypt or Saudi Arabia or others. I don't want to dismiss that. But the way we work is that instead of saying because that exists, it's a race to the bottom, therefore we're going to discount um, what's happening, is trying to overcome that by um, applying the same standard across the board beyond beyond these borders and also i think what's important is to work on connecting iranian civil society movement to the region and globally um, iranian civil society is extremely isolated because of the repression and because of the geopolitical factors that um, often eliminates them from conversations that are happening at the regional level and happening globally um, in reality i think there is a lot that could be exchanged with the region with latin america with other countries that are going other other movements that are going through this so for me um in order to overcome the barriers of reporting and, and geopoliticized narratives in Iran is try to break the isolation of those who are working on Iran, giving them access to information and peer support. Extremely difficult. I'm not saying it's possible easily because it would be they would be the target of government crackdown. But that's how I envision. Otherwise, us sitting abroad are inherently acting as gatekeepers. I am the one explaining what's happening in Iran instead of someone who's been leading the protests in Iran. That's a reality. It's a, it's a it's a burden on our shoulder. But I think trying to break the barriers and make it more connected um, will hopefully show the diversity of opinion, the nuances of debate that that can be discounted when it's when the geopolitical lens is immediately enforced on on, a, on a, understanding Iran. Thank you, Tara. If, if I may just add, you know, uh, something on this, I think there's a lot going on in Iran. There's a lot of debates, you know, people are do, I mean, are debating what's the, you know, the head forward and, um, you know, the best way to, you know, to keep things going on, how to deal with external pressure, whether that's coming from Russia, whether that's coming from the US. And I think, you know, this, also is tightly connected to what is happening in the diaspora, which is, you know, a different conversation, but has a lot to do, you know, at the same time has a lot of uh, impact and of course has a lot to do with what people in Iran are discussing. Um, I, I think this is this is extremely important and also perhaps keeping the focus and uh, you know even just noticing that there's a you know there's a debate going on in Iran is a good way to I think put in perspective the uh, existing and important but still uh, you, you know the the sorry the uh, the influence and the presence of, uh, you know, this geopolitical contrasting interests, which are important, are, you know, are present, they do have an impact, but there's a lot also going on. And uh, apart from, you know, from, from this geopolitical contrasting, you know, interest and, uh, uh, I mean, inter foreign interferences. So I think there's, I mean, this, this is important, but we often, we often, um, you know, run have I mean run the risk of um, um, 
you know, placing our focus on what's going on outside and forgetting that there's a lot going on inside. And perhaps that's, I mean, that's more important. Than, you know, or it, uh, as you pointed out, Iranians are engaging with that question and are debating it. Um, um, just a few weeks ago, there was a statement by 20 unions and feminist groups inside the country um, point, pointing out a set of 12 demands that also included um, questions on Iran's international relations, nuclear appropriation, um, economic justice, access to free education and healthcare, as well as civil and political rights and minority rights. So the debate is happening. Um, and as you said, um, it being complicated by geopolitical factor should not be the reason that we don't, tr we won't try harder to see the polarity and the diversity and the nuances of it. Um, and so in that sense, having this um, um, social media platforms allows for more access and more conversation, but also uh, parallel conversations are happening. So you need, to, um, you need to actually pay attention to various aspects of the debate. Yeah, definitely. And just today there was another, uh, another uh, statement released by, you know, self um, called Coalition of Women. So it's on um, Zamane, uh, Radio, Radio Zamane uh, website. Anyway, uh, so we have a few more questions. So I'd like to to go through them. I know we only have nine minutes, but um, uh, I think it's important. So Kelino Sullivan from the Institute asks, what can those outside of Iran um how, sorry, can those outside of Iran support this activism online in a meaningful way and keep the momentum going? We have a question by um, Siavash Sharif, uh, who's a researcher at Tehran University. And he ask, um, ask you, uh, Tara, please, to comment on the role of foreign interference in contributing to the ongoing issues in Iran. So we, we kind of go back to this question. Um, and then we have one final question by Keril. Uh, have Western sanctions helped or hindered the freedom movement in Iran? Really easy ones, <laughs> very straightforward. Um, so how can they help? Um, I think we started answering that question by suggesting um, the need to engage with the nuance of the debate that is coming from inside the country. Um, so uh, recognizing and acknowledging the complexity, uh, being willing to, to commit to understanding and echoing voices is very, very important. Um, I see a lot of, um, not in this movement actually, I think we've, we've enjoyed a lot of support, but we uh, sometimes see some of the progressive voices not wanting to enter the debate that be in support of Iranian people because it gets complicated. It's not as straightforward. So putting that like first commitment to, in, to engaging and understanding um, is, is very important. And with every action that is being taken either at the policy level or at the citizen level, what we're trying to, I think the way I look at the equation is that you have this very unequal power balance between people and the repressive government. So what you want to do is to support and empower people. And when deciding about policy intervention, which will then get to the, the question, the, the two other question, if the intervention is, is putting enormous amount of harm on the power of people, you're, you're defeating the purpose, even if you were claiming that this is in support of people. So understanding how you frame the equation, how you frame this idea of standing by Iranian people, and to what extent you're willing to, to commit to the complexity of it for me is, 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 is key. Um, but first, but another thing that is simple, yet requires a lot of commitment is to uh, committing to echoing their voice, the voices that are coming from inside and, and following their stories and humanizing their struggle. Uh, we have this moments of eruptions that get the attention of me international media, a lot of international um, forces join um, on TikTok, on platforms, on universities, and then the next big news happens, the, the news cycle moves on, the struggle remains. Um, so supporting um, people 
picking one person, someone who has been killed, someone who's in prison, someone who's a labor activist, someone whom you can connect to and trying to follow their story that is not just those epic periods of like person X is arrested. Actually, per person X is now released from prison, but cannot get a job um, because that's that's how various elements of repression work to contain uh, dissent. Humanizing the struggle, human, humanizing the generations of struggle, people who are supporting the movement have been fighting for decades. Like people who have joined this movement are the ones who are fighting for truth and justice for the victims of 80s mass execution, for the chain assassination of dissidents in, in, um, in late 90s. So people stay and, and keep coming back to it. If we can bring out these dimensions, I think it, it manifests the, the, the importance and the enormous nature of the struggle. Um, for interference, I have no doubt that political forces have their own agenda inside and outside the country. I and and many of the forces, if outside forces that are um, in, uh, that have their agenda, their, their agenda is not necessarily to support a um, peaceful transition to a free and secular um, country that can become a competitor in so many levels. I have. And, and a lot can, can get lost in every con country and state and political group have their own agenda. And they do try to um, echo that in their messaging. But the, the core of the problems, the root causes, the reasons people are coming to the street is local, is, is their lived experience. Um, it, is, it is the real, everyday reality of having to go out and deal with abusive morality police. It's the reality of the economic situation deteriorating. Is it sanctions? Is it government policy? Are there both? The answer is both. It's not an either or. Government enacts policies in response to sanction that further entrenches rights. Um, the government has serious co corruption and mismanagement issues. So what we're dealing, what, what the person who is sitting in Iran is receiving is the accumulative impact of these things. But the, the causes, the issues, the, the problems with govern, undemocratic governance in Iran are local and are real. Um, so until those are resolved, um, the root causes remain and create opportunities for all sorts of actors to take advantage of them. Um, and the question of sanctions, are they helping or harming, I think is a very simple, I know we're, we're interested in categorizing, it's like this group or that group, but the reality is that the question is, is complicated, requires, um, requires a closer look. Um, and the debates that are reductionist in wanting to find, put the blame either on outside or inside um, overlooks the, the accumulative nature of the problem that Iranians are dealing with. So what we can, what I can say from the research that I have done um, on access to um, medication as well as um, medical education is that in so many ways, um, um, broad sectoral sanctions um, have contributed to um, Path for procurement of medicine, material for education, um, becoming much more restrictive and difficult, and has created a more um, untransparent economy that is being even more abusive against um, people on so many ways. Um, the ability of Iranian civil society to organize and mobilize is also impacted by their economic struggle. We saw a lot of um, calls for general strikes in the beginning of the protest. No one answers the question of like how a labor union that is under a crackdown by the government can go on a strike if people cannot put bread on their table. Um, and also there, the, the nature of um, restrictions on, on um, um, approaching the question of Iran, not having transparent financial channel really limits abilities for economic, uh, for, uh, for academic exchanges, cultural interactions, it, um, and um, contributes to isolation of civil society, an issue that I, 
I have raised earlier. Um, so if I may, instead of saying help or help or it hurts, it definitely compounds the, the impact and the restrictions. And I think um, uh, when looking at the question as a matter of policy intervention, it is essential for a state to look into this as an integral element of the assessment that they need to do um, when um, rolling out these measures that have actually gone for decades at this point. Tara, thank you so much for this extremely interesting um, um, seminar, webinar, actually. And thanks for being so generous in, uh, you know, sharing your wisdom and your insights uh, into the current situation in Iran, but, you know, also into, into your own, the research you yourself have been, uh, you know, have been uh, carrying out. Um, so um, I'd like to, you know, <laughs> give you an applause for, um, what to share with us um and uh i think it's uh i think we we'll we come to to a close of uh to an end of our session it's 4 p.m and thanks everyone for for being with us and for uh following us and uh until the next time thank you so much